concept of government power is a strange and complex cipher. The existence of governments has always been predicated on assumptions of necessity, but few societies have ever truly considered what those necessities might be. What is government actually good for? What do they do that is so important? And what happens when a government fails in the roles and duties that a culture deems vital? We tend to view government as an inevitability of life, but the fact is government is not a force of nature. It is an imperfect creation of man, and it can be dismantled by men just as easily as it can be established. In America, many people see government as an extension of the republic, or even the source, or an animal that feeds at the behest of the common citizen. An often heard argument against the idea of drastic change or even rebellion within the establishment system is the assertion that the government is us, that it is made of Americans, by Americans, and for Americans that there is no separation between the public and the base of power. This is, of course, a childish and fantastical delusion drawn from a complete lack of understanding as to how our system really operates today. How many people out there who make this argument really believe at their very core that they have any legitimate influence over the actions of the state? I wager not many. At bottom, to cling to the lie that the government as it stands is a construct of the people is an act of pure denial designed to help the lost masses cope with underlying feelings of utter powerlessness. Unfortunately, the U.S. government has shown clearly through words and actions that its concerns are not with the average American and that its loyalties rest with decidedly smaller and more elite interest groups. When elections once meant to dissuade political abuse become a false paradigm tool for the maximization of tyranny, have we not lost our voice as a society? When any government decides it is no longer concerned with the freedom and prosperity of a nation, no matter how righteous that government claims to be, we must, as citizens, ask ourselves whether that government is still useful to us and what kind of power it should be allowed to wield. It is a dereliction of our duty, not just as Americans, but as human beings, to simply treat government as a realm outside of our control or concern. It is lazy. It is dangerous. It could very well be disastrous. Government should answer to us now and forever. As the new millennium stampedes forward, however, it appears that the intended roles of the American dynamic have been reversed. The progression of the past decade has seen a hailstorm of legislation and executive orders that impede personal liberties and erode constitutional protections in place for centuries. So many trails toward totalitarianism have been blazed recently that it is becoming difficult to track them all. And yet, I do not think many in our country have asked themselves what this means to their future. What kind of rights are you ready to hand over to government? How many aspects of your life should the establishment be able to dictate? How much freedom are you willing to give away? While pondering these questions, each man and woman should also take into account the powers that those in government think they deserve. What have they asked for lately? What have they taken without permission? Here is just a short list of the more detrimental declarations of authority attempted over the past decade, along with the pieces of legislation and executive orders used to make them, quote, all legal. End quote. The power to invade your privacy. The U.S. government has long held at least a private belief 
that it should be allowed access to every aspect of a citizen's personal life. In the past, the excuse of criminal suspicion was a standard rationalization, but this expanded beyond the targeting of individuals to broader surveillance of the populace as a whole with the advent of the drug war. Financial records especially became subject to governmental perusal without warrant and generally without any criminal charges filed. This trampling of the Fourth Amendment over a fabrication of a war on substances that by all rights should be legal anyway was just a taste of what was to come. With the explosion of the war on terror, another fabricated conflict, the application of mass surveillance became standardized. The Patriot Act and the FISA bill, both upheld by so-called Republican and Democratic presidents, have opened the door for centralized electronic spying in the name of national security. Never before has the world seen such an unbridled assault on the private lives of common citizens. The Big Brother grids of the Soviet era are child's play compared to the data mining of the 21st century. And this tyranny is made possible by the marriage of government and corporate interests, working in tandem to ensure an ever-tightening net. The usual ill-conceived debate point for such surveillance is the claim that it is for the greater good for our own safety, and that if we have nothing to hide, we have nothing to fear. It is not uncommon for slaves to embrace the loss of privacy in the name of safety, even if that feeling of safety is an illusion. But in the end, whether we have something to hide is none of the government's concern. In a true republic, innocent until proven guilty is a paramount ideal and this ideal cannot exist in a country where everyone is treated as a suspect at every moment of every day. No politician, no corporate body, no president, no alphabet agency in existence is exalted enough to play the all-seeing, all-judging eye of God. This kind of power in the hands of any organization whose sole purpose is self-preservation and expansion at any cost is absolutely unacceptable. The power to silence. From the DHS to the private Federal Reserve to Google and Facebook, the tides of opinion and social observation are being tracked, cataloged, and flagged for future intervention. With active programs now in place to identify and isolate negative online criticism of these institutions, as well as to marginalize freelance web journalists and more mainstream media icons with a strong voice, the general public is finally beginning to see what we in the liberty movement have been warning about for years. The invasion of privacy is merely the first step in the process of silencing dissent. If the citizenry is put in a position in which they know they are constantly being watched, they may decide to censor themselves to avoid possible retribution. In fact, the destruction of free speech has always been accomplished in history, first by the target population itself. Terrified of real and imagined consequences, people begin to filter their own views until a single, harmless, and homogenized collective voice forms. The near miss of SOPA legislation has proven as well that the government hopes to one day be able to summarily vaporize internet outlets based on whatever guidelines they see fit to apply. It also shows that the American public is not going to roll over while this occurs. I think it is safe to say that the internet is the very last bastion of free speech in the world. Free from filtration, bureaucratic meddling and corporate vampirism. SOPA was a test case. New and more subversive methods will arise and shutting down the web as we know it will be a number priority for our government for the foreseeable future. Free speech zones aside, protest is becoming far more difficult in this country. 
less than lethal devices like tasers, rubber bullets, tear gas, sound cannons, microwave guns, etc., have humanized the act of government violence against peaceful protest. But the effect of violating the First Amendment are the same. Add to this the use of fusion centers to coordinate armies of riot cops with the help of the DHS, the FBI, and even the military. And you have a high-grade goon machine constructed to undermine the people's right to redress grievances. It has become obvious that this government not only wants to stifle your ability to effect change through electoral means, but it is also determined to make sure you can't openly complain about being muscled out of the political process either. The fact is, government is not a force of nature. It is an imperfect creation of man and it can be dismantled by men just as easily as it can be established. In America, many people see government as an extension of the Republic, or even the source, or an animal that feeds at this, have ever truly considered what those necessities might be. What is government actually good for? What do they do that is so important? And what happens when a government fails in the roles and duties that a culture deems vital? We tend to view government as an inevitability of life, but the fact and the base of power. This is, of course, a childish and fantastical delusion drawn from a complete lack of understanding as to how our system really operates today. How many people out there who make this argument really believe at their very core that they have any legitimate inf behest of the common citizen? An often heard argument against the idea of drastic change or even rebellion within the establishment system is the assertion that the government is us, that it is made of Americans, by Americans, and for Americans that there is no separation between the public the concept of government power is a strange and complex cipher the existence of governments has always been predicated on assumptions of necessity but few societies